Planning and Zoning and Building Committee. Roll call, please. Alderman Sismarski? Here. Alderman Woods? Here. Alderman Roy Wesley? Here. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Alderman Sorrentino? Here. Alderman Messina? Here. Alderman Catalano? Here. Alderman Jacob? Here. I declare quorum. Um, next, do I need approval of the minutes of planning and zoning and building regular meeting Jan January 28, 2016? That is my motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any corrections? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, we're going to move it, uh, the, some of the, uh, the agenda around. So we're going to do the, um, the Salt Creek maintenance shed annexation. And we have a speaker, Matt. Elliman, if you want to address the, uh, Thank you, uh, if you want to go to the podium, oh. yeah. Thank you, Council and staff, for giving me an opportunity to address you for just a brief moment. Uh, my name is Matthew Elman, the Executive Director of the Park District. The reason I'm here tonight is we've put a request in to annex about 4.4 acres of our property that was recently acquired from the Forest Preserve District into the city. Uh, this property was acquired uh, about two years ago for the sole purpose uh, of helping um, facilitate our golf operation. It's acreage that we were leasing from the Forest Preserve for many years where our shed for our maintenance operations for the golf course sits. And um, now that we own it, uh, we can put some improvements into it. And we also know that we um, get great services from the city and would like to make that easier to occur. Currently, it's unincorporated. So for example, if we have any need for city services, in particular police services, uh, they dispatch the sheriff's office. And generally, the, uh, they call the city anyway and say, we don't know where this is. Uh, can you help us out? Um, the reason I'm here tonight in particular is right now that facility that we have there um, has not had much in the way of improvements. We don't have any long-range plans to use the property other than maybe develop um, a nursery or something that's environmentally um, proactive on that property. But we probably want to make some improvements in the future to our maintenance facility. We don't have, for example, a restroom there. They're using a port -a ladder. They go to the clubhouse. Um, we know that uh, the city code right now doesn't require septic fields or additional wells. We have a well to, to get water out there. So we just wanted to be on the public record tonight that we may come back in the future. We don't have any plan at this point to request a variance for those purposes. We know that that's not something you can grant conditional now, nor are we asking for that. I just wanted that to be on the public record so that in the future, if we do make that request, we could reference back to my time here tonight. Other than that, I'm happy to entertain any questions and we appreciate the support we've gotten from the city. Uh, and uh, look forward to uh, hearing your um, actions tonight uh, to hopefully move this forward. Okay, uh, Alderman Roy Wesley. I make a motion to annex the property of Salt Creek. Second. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next, we're going to have a recess and we're going to jump to the, um, the Finance and Administration Committee. Okay, uh, let the minute taker note that the same people are here for uh, the Finance and Administration Committee. Like a make, a make a motion for the Finance Administration to approve the minutes for the Finance and Administration Committee uh, January 14, 2016. Do I have a second? Second. All in, any uh, questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes. Next, we have the report and recommendation, the fiscal year 2015 audit report. We'll leave this up to uh, Brad. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, this evening uh, we have the annual audit uh, report um, as required by state statute. I have two individuals uh, from Sikich who performed our audit, uh, as was mentioned in the memo. This is the first year of their engagement. Uh, with us tonight we have uh, partner Mr. Jim Savio and senior manager Mr. Anthony Cervini. Uh, they're going to go through a brief presentation and then you know, answer uh, any questions that you guys may have uh, based upon the report. Yes, uh, uh, Alderman Wesley. First, we got to change page, page one. It says elected official. Frank Lazar's on there. Should be Randy Messina, right? Mr. Wilson. Uh, that was uh, as of 430, and the new board wasn't sworn in until May. So. Okay. Okay, let's continue. Well, good evening. On behalf of SICK, I should like to thank the council and, and staff for the opportunity to present the results of our audit of the city as of and for the fiscal year ended April 30th, 2015. Again, my name is Anthony Servini. I'm the senior audit manager with SICK for the city's audit. And again, Jim Savio, the engagement partner for the city's audit. Just to briefly go through a few items uh, discussing the reports issued for the city's audit this year. The first item which you have in front of you this evening the larger of the, bound, larger of the bound documents, the comprehensive annual financial report. I'll highlight just a few sections on this and, and then uh, Jim will go through in a little bit more detail some of the specific information related to that. The comprehensive annual financial report is broken into three separate sections, the introductory section, financial section, and the uh, stat section. The introductory section, if you're going to look at one document in that particular section, you'll want to look at the letter of transmittal. The letter of transmittal is really a, a great opportunity where the city's management has a chance to address some of the happenings during the course of the fiscal year for the city, as well as going through and addressing some of the, uh, the future happenings that, that, that may occur, what the impact of those would be. The second section, the largest of the sections, is the financial section. This includes the audited financial statements, as well as the notes to the financial statements and also what we call our combining and individual fund financial statements, all breaking out the di different detail and budget versus actual schedules for all of the city's funds. Finally, the last section towards the back of the comprehensive annual financial report is the stat section. Stat section is really a great tool if you're looking uh, for a historical perspective as to where the city, where the city has been and, and where things are at now. There's 10 years of trend data and that's scheduled for a variety of, of indicators as specified by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board on that. The second document that you also have in front of you this evening, uh, the black cover on it, the auditor's communication to members of the council and management. This document includes four components, the first being our required communications to the council in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards. This covers certain matters related to the plan scope and timing of our audit as well as uh, certain information, whether we had any disagreements with management, we're pleased to report we did not have any, as well as other information throughout the addressed in the comprehensive annual financial report. After the required communication piece in there, you'll see the adjusting journal entries that were proposed and posted as part of this year's audit. After that, you'll see what we refer to as our past adjustments. Our past adjustments are, are items that we identified that could have been adjusted on the audited financial statements. However, we're not required to, to have those adjustments made due to the materiality levels of those particular amounts. Finally, the last piece of that document is our management letter. Our management letter includes our uh, various recommendations for improvement as well as a listing of the future Governmental Accounting Standard Board's pronouncements that will impact the city. We issued two other documents as part of our audit process. Uh, the single audit report, which we do not have in front of you this evening, but has been completed. The single audit report is required anytime the city expends greater than $500,000 in federal funds. Uh, for fiscal year 2015, the city spent approximately $6.5 million in federal funds, $6.3 million being related to the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, Agency's uh, North Wastewater Treatment Plan for the city on that. We're also in the process of finalizing the data collection form that's related directly to the single audit report. That is a uh, basically an online version of the single audit that's required to be filed with the 
Federal Audit Clearinghouse. Last but not least, we've also filed the city's annual comptroller report with the state of Illinois. Again, that goes into the state's online database for all filings there, as well as the uh, <clears throat> certain information uh, structured in the way that the comptroller has presented that. With that, I'll turn it over to, to Jim to review some specific information from the comprehensive <coughs> annual financial report. You have a question? But, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Alderman Messina? Yeah, I was looking at the statistical section. Do you guys have a summary of some of those trends and patterns when you guys go back 10 years? Uh, so as part of this, the stat section, we do not actually go through and, and perform it. That's actually an unaudited section It is unaudited. throughout that. Okay. So we go through and verify that the data from a year-to-year -year standpoint is, is lining up with where it historically has in there. But in terms of an analysis on that, that's something that is usually more so addressed in the letter of transmittal or the management's discussion and analysis in the, uh, the front section of the report. Alderman Messina. Is that in the front of this report or is that something you can get us, Brad? Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see trends and patterns within this. I mean, this does me no good other than raw data. It's like giving me a slip receipt, but I want a summary of what are we seeing trends and patterns. That provides more value, in my opinion. So the management's discussion and analysis, which will be on, if you turn to the financial section of the comprehensive annual financial report, um, just paginated MD&A page one. This is going to be the, the most detail in terms of an analysis from a year-to-year -year perspective. Now, this is just presenting a current year and prior year analysis to that. The stat section, as presented in the back of this report, doesn't, governmental accounting standard board doesn't, statement number 44 doesn't require any sort of detailed analysis for that. That's something that certainly uh, should council desire could be included in the letter of transmittal section if there is more detail wanted to that. But those two letters in the front of the report are where um, any analysis that has been presented would be there. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, let's continue, please. I'm going to point out a few of the highlights of the comprehensive annual financial report. Uh, as Anthony said, I'm going to start out in the introductory section. Uh, I just want to point out that the uh, city received the uh, Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association uh, for the year ended April 30th, 2014. Uh, we feel that the uh, current CAFR also meets uh, the requirements of the certificate program and anticipate that it will receive the uh, certificate as well. I also want to point out that uh, only about 2% of governments with a population less than 25,000 receive this award. Uh, so it's a great accomplishment for the city. Uh, turning to the financial section, very first page after the uh, financial section tab is the independent auditor's report. Uh, these three pages are the only pages that we as auditors are responsible for. Management's responsible for the rest of the 124-page uh, document. And those responsibilities are listed out here on page one and the very top of page two. <clears throat> turning over to page two, up at the top is the opinion paragraph. Uh, once again, uh, issued an unmodified opinion on the city's financial statements, and that's the highest level of assurance that we can provide to the city. And right below that, we had a change in accounting principle. Uh, the city adopted GASB statement number 67, financial reporting for pension plans, and that modified certain footnote disclosures uh, and required supplementary information. And we'll uh, touch on that in a few minutes. Turning over to uh, page MD&A, page one, as uh, Anthony talked about <clears throat> real briefly. This management discussion and analysis was prepared by Brad and uh, provides a really good overview of the uh, city's finances, uh, both financial position and the changes in financial position for the year. It'll also point out any significant changes that might have occurred uh, throughout the year. And as Anthony said, uh, provides some good comparative data that you can't find elsewhere in the comprehensive <coughs> annual financial report. I always say, I sound like a broken record, but if there's one thing you want to read in this entire document, read the MDNA, because like I said, it provides a good overview of the city's finances. Turning over to page four, pages four through six are what we call the government-wide financial statements, and they basically provide uh, or present the consolidated financial statements of the city. So all of the non-fiduciary funds are included here. So the police pension fund and the special service area agency funds are not included here, but all the other funds are. It is broken out by governmental activities, which are your governmental funds, and then business type activities, which are your uh, enterprise funds. So the 
<clears throat> water and sewer operating, commuter parking lot, and then the sanitation fund are included in the business type activities. This is prepared on the uh, economic resources measurement focus and the full accrual basis of accounting. And basically what that means is it has a long-term focus. So it has capital assets and long-term debt included in these amounts. And they're similar to financial statements that you would find uh, in a for-profit corporation. Uh, one thing I'll point out on page four, the statement of net position or your balance sheet. Uh, down below the net position or retained earnings if this were a corporation, your largest component is the net investment in capital assets. And then down below the unrestricted net position for governmental activities this year, about 10.3 million, uh, and for business type activities, about <coughs> $2.6 million. Turning over to page five and six is the statement of activities or the net income statement. And two things I'll point out on page six, the change in net position or net income. Governmental activities had about a $900,000 uh, uh, positive change in net position. And then business type activities, about $196,000 uh, increase. And right below that, we had a prior period adjustment for governmental activities. And further detail of that is in footnote 11 on page 47. And basically related to revenue and expense recognition, as well as uh, capital asset restatement. Why haven't we shown this on that screen? Yeah, yeah if yeah, we, we could show the slides. I mean, everything that you just spoke about, I read a lot of numbers, but the residents can't see. Mr. City Manager? As it will be hard for the residents to uh, comprehend such numbers in a quick fashion, it's uh, all these reports are published online, the CAF or our annual budget, all that's online. It will be a little easier to read than, you know, we'll put it up there, but it could be hard to grasp all these but numbers so a, quickly. It's on the line, online too. Correct. Well, the residents aren't going to see this anyway. <laughs> so, Pete, let's continue. continue. <laughs> Page 7 through 10 are the uh, governmental fund financial statements. Um, and these show all of the major funds, uh, the general fund and capital projects fund. And then all the non-major governmental funds are all combined in the aggregate uh, in the third column. <coughs> and this is presented on the current financial resources measurement focus and the modified accrual basis of accounting, which basically means that it's a short-term, almost budgetary focus, uh, focus uh, just on current spendable resources. And what I like to point out on page seven, the very first column, your general fund. All the way down at the bottom, your unassigned fund balance was about $9.5 million, which is an increase from $8.9 million in the uh, previous year. And that's about 79% of your current year expenditures, or about a nine month reserve. And that meets the uh, target fund balance of 50%. That's uh, noted in footnote 1N. And turning over to page nine, the statement of revenues, expenditures, changes in fund balance, or your income statement for your governmental funds. Again, the first column is your general fund. You'll see a net change in fund balance, a positive $129,000. Uh, Alderman Messina has a question. Go ahead. So just, you mentioned a pretty important point for the people listening at home. In, in our reserves, nine and a half million, about nine month reserve. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, health, nice. a, a healthy reserve. Okay. So, what's continue? In your professional experience, what's average for most municipalities? Average is probably maybe six months okay. on average. Usually, it'll range from about four to nine months or so. Right. So it's it, it's within a, a good range, and it's definitely a, a nice healthy reserve to have. So. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Uh, turning over to page 12, this uh, statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in net position for your proprietary funds gives a little more detail um, for the water and sewer operating fund, which is your major uh, proprietary fund, and then non-major enterprises, that second column over. Two things I'll point out on page 12, the operating income, which is about halfway down the page. Uh, operating income for water and sewer is about 169000 so your uh, charges for services are covering all of your operating expenses, including your depreciation expense, which is a non-cash uh, expense. And down at the bottom, for water and sewer operations, your change in net position, or once again, your net income, 
about two hundred and thirty eight thousand dollars so good year for the uh, water and sewer operating fund and turning over to page thirty three we're into the footnotes now <clears throat> I'll wait for Brad to catch up so footnote 7a for your police pension fund this is what changed with Gasby's statement 67 a lot of the information looks familiar it hasn't changed it's the same as under Gasby 27 uh, there are uh, however a few new components that I'll point out real quick there's a, a target allocation for investments by investment type and it also expected long-term rate of return for those investments. That's on page 35. There's also disclosed now uh, the investment rate of return for the year for the police pension fund. That's listed on page 36. There's also a, a, a listing of the net pension liability, which is on page 38. And then finally on page 40, there's uh, some sensitivity analysis related uh, to that net pension Alderman Messina, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a question on the police pension fund. And sure. Just let me know if I have to take it offline. But some of these, so we have people that, we have three people, if I'm reading this right, that are inactive members, entitled to, but not even receiving benefits. How does that, how does that happen? They may have retired before they were eligible for benefits. Okay. That's most likely what it is, but we could uh, find out. We'll ask the Chief Vesta. I, I, I'm not on this. the pension board anymore, but uh, <laughs> at the time of this, we had people that had more than the required years of service and the yeah. age had been attained, but they were still working for us and had not retired. That might be what they're referring to. Like we just had one recently retire with 34 years of service. So. Gotcha. Okay, thanks. Okay, we could continue. Uh, I'll point out on page 40, um, the discount rate sensitivity. This shows you what your net pension liability is um, at the current discount rate. And then also if the discount rate were decreased by 1% or increased by 1%. So you can see kind of how that affects your liability um, based on that discount rate. And then page 53 is also um, about page 53, half of it, the very first uh, top part is new for Gatsby Statement 67. That shows uh, actuarially determined contributions, the contributions that were actually made, and then any contribution deficiency or excess. And then below that shows covered employee payroll, and then the contributions as a percentage of that covered payroll. And basically, we'll build this out to 10 years of data. Uh, we'll just uh, prospectively uh, implement it, and then we'll add uh, a year you know, information for each year until we have 10 years of information. And then page 55 is also new with GASB 67. This shows the components or the changes in the employer's net pension liability and the related ratios. So you can see your total pension liability, which is um, mainly determined by the actuary. Uh, you'll see the changes uh, from beginning of the year to the end of the year. <coughs> right below that, your planned fiduciary net position. This cha change in your uh, net position for the year. And then down below shows the uh, net pension liability again. And then right below that shows the funded ratio, about 59.86%. Uh, covered employee payroll again. And then the, uh, pen the employer's net pension liability as a percentage of that covered payroll uh, right below that. And then 56 is the last new required supplementary information for GASB 67. Again, uh, as with 55 and 56, uh, we'll build out 10 years of information uh, eventually for this. And this shows the annual money-weighted rate of return, net of investment expense. So you'll see the, the fund had a return of almost 6% for 2015. I would be happy at this point uh, to answer um, any questions they might have on the CAFR or any of the other reports. Uh, do we have any questions? <clears throat> Why not? I'll ask one more. Okay. Alderman Messina. <laughs> On page 55, maybe it's education, but how could that percentage be so high when we're at the employee's net pension and liability? So our liability is a percent of payroll. Is How does it get to be that high? Uh, the, the last ratio, the 472%. Right. Can you explain that, what that, really, what that means? Yeah, that's, it's basically to try to give you um, kind of relatively, that net pension liability 
relative to your covered payroll, your annual covered payroll for the year, just to kind of give you a, um, a ratio or a, a way to kind of compare it. So are we saying it's over four times our pension liabilities, four times oh, our? Almost five times. Almost yeah. five times our yeah. payroll. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So obviously the lower the number, the better. The better. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's what caught my eye. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would imagine this is pretty typical among all government entities. Yeah, especially for police and fire pensions. Okay. And most of them are not funded, you know, as well as, say, like IMRF would be. So, yeah, it's pretty pretty similar situations Thanks. in other, other communities. So. Uh, Mr. Wilson? And just, I know this question comes up every year during budget time, but I'll, I'll hit it here since we're talking about the police pension fund. You know, every year the, the pension fund submits to us what their actuarial request is uh, to fund the pension uh, per the actuarial uh, study that's done by uh, Lauterbach and Amon. And every year we fully fund that. So um, you know, a few years ago there were people that weren't funding their pensions, things of that nature. I mean, we fully fund what they ask for every year. And then at that point, it's just a matter of what the returns are, what the market does. Like, you know, so far this year, the market's been, uh, we'll just go down a little bit, uh, the stock market. So they're not having too good of a year, you know. Um, but, you know, we fully fund what they ask for, and then the rest of it's all in the uh, actuarial assumptions, mortality tables, and uh, indicative rate of return that gets built into their assumptions. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, do you, uh, for this, these numbers, do you get this from our pension board? Because you're, you're not the one putting all this together from, from the police pension board are you? I am not. Um, yeah, we get this uh, through the police pension board, especially this year with GASB 67 coming in. Um, I know the auditors and Lauterbach and Eamon worked very closely together, um, playing the reports back and forth. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, this section largely comes from the actuary report that the uh, actuary retained by uh, the police pension board performs. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I would like to thank you for the presentation, and uh, I'd like to also thank our finance director, Mr. Wilson, for doing such a fine job. Uh, and uh, Mr. Wilson, you have another question? No, I so, say yeah, we do uh, next week need to uh, approve a resolution uh, accepting the audit, so we do need a motion to accept the audit then. That's when you're uh, done uh, with the Yeah, I was going to make a motion to accept the fiscal year 2015 audit report. Uh, do I have a second? Second. second. Uh, could I get a roll call, please? Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Wesley? Yes. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. That passes. Um, items to be considered at future meetings. Uh, the budget, uh, February 25th. <coughs> I make a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Meeting adjourned. Okay, so we're going to go back to the planning and zoning and building committee. Okay, so next uh, reporter, go ahead, um, Alderman Smosky. Uh, for financial and administration, I wanted to put down on that future meetings, added uh, garbage dis uh, waste waste treatment, or garbage disposal contract coming up. Uh, Mr. Manager? Yeah, that would be on a, a way future agenda. I mean, we're, we're starting I just want to make sure it's on there. So, yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we got a report and recommendation, uh, the UDO tax amendments, and that we have a presentation. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yes, Chairman, I'll just uh, briefly give an introduction. Um, under the UDO tax amendments, I would say probably the main um, amendment or the main driving of these amendments would be the law coverage. Uh, discussion and I know everyone will remember this was discussed at committee back in I believe in September <coughs> of last year when we had a number of variances that exceeded the 35 percent um, 
we were directed to study some other communities and see what their percentages were, which we did. We came back in de December, and we found in comparison with some neighboring and comparable communities that were our 35 uh, percent was lower than those other communities. So moving forward um, with the direction of the uh, committee, um, there was a public hearing at the CDC in January. Um, and really, um, Ms. Christie's going to go through that presentation. I would say the lot coverage is probably the main event. Just touch on a couple other things that I know um, certainly would be of interest. Um, some of the definitions in there that we did modify or propose to modify. Um, simple things, uh, but important things. Really, the definition section of the UDO, for example, doesn't have a de definition of a comprehensive plan. We've all discussed that and the need to update it in the future. We're being proactive, putting that definition in so we can reference it. Uh, lot coverage needs a definition. That's in there also. Um, and then just a couple of um, house cleaning items, such as changing the reference to the ZBA to the CDC. So with that, um, I'll hand over to Ms. Christie to go through the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. As Mr. Cage uh, noted, we did do a survey of some neighboring suburbs, and we did find that Wooddale is, has the lowest percentage maximum for lot coverage. As you can see, it's typical to have 50% or no maximum um, in some of these other communities. As we look at the city's sort of um, range of lot coverage, 35% is the maximum for all single-family residential districts. And then we go up from there. We have industrial areas that have 70 to 80% lot coverage, and then we have some that have no maximum at all, and those are typically in the town center business district. With more than 50% of the land area dedicated to single-family residential, we started looking at the definitions um, and the regulations. For building coverage, we have a maximum of 30%. We're not proposing any change to that other than a definitional change to clarify that structures are under roof. Currently, that is not uh, um, in the definitions. And then we have lot coverage, as we discussed, is a maximum of 35%. This includes structures, anything under roof, as well as flat work, which would be Primarily just impervious surfaces is what we're looking uh, to clarify with that. Specifically, the definition for lot coverage that's being proposed is the percentage of a zoning lot improved with impervious surfaces. Now, we've had some discussion regarding decks and pools. From a stormwater management standpoint from our stormwater ordinance, there is a little bit of a, a difference here. The stormwater ordinance states that anything that is gravel that's uncompacted can count as 60%, which is where this percentage here came from to try and be consistent. Typically, when you install a deck, you will install it with a gravel base below. It's not always the case. But the other issues that we came across is that depending on the type of material used for a deck, if it's, say, composite decking, then the deck boards can actually be closer together because you don't have to account for expansion and contraction. If it's wood, you've got that, and then you don't have a definitive spacing between to determine, to make the call of, as to whether or not it's impervious or pervious. Um, so what we've done is tried to make administration of this a little bit easier and still provide some flexibility, as uh, council has indicated their desire to do. And then also swimming pools was another factor that was discussed. The difficulty in regulating swimming pools is that from a stormwater standpoint, it's actually counted as impervious area because there's no definitive, um, uh, when you fill a pool and rainwater collects in it, then it'll, it'll go, it'll, the amount between the top of the surface and the actual overflow point can reduce, and so it fluctuates. So in order to provide a little bit of flexibility for those that have swimming pools, we wanted to be consistent in terms of the percentage, and so we came up with, for purposes of calculating lot coverage only, decks and swimming pools will be counted as 60% impervious. And then we've gone through and we've added a definition for impervious surface. 
and it is essentially land cover that cannot effectively absorb or infiltrate water, including but not limited to, and then we give <coughs> some examples. Now, this definition was run by our village engineer, and he concurs with this. This is consistent with other definitions that we have in um, the stormwater <laughs> ordinance. Um, and then we also then have to define pervious surface. And so those are materials that allow water to percolate into the soil to filter out pollutants and recharge the water table. And then there's a series of examples here which I'm actually going to go through now. Porous concrete is, um, it is simply concrete that does have sort of pores in them to allow water to um, absorb into or through these pores and into then the subbase. And so the subbase has specific engineering requirements in order for this all to be considered porous. As you can see from the, the photograph um, on the left, the water goes straight through. I do actually have a video if, if we want to take a look at that when we um, get through. Another option for permeable surfaces is permeable pavers. The example that's shown here is probably the most widely known and large scale application of this in our area, which is the Morton Arboretum. It was installed many years ago. The engineers at the time weren't sure that this would actually hold the capacity that it was, that it stated it would hold. They required that they still build a detention area next to this parking lot. And the engineers have told me that they actually don't even, the water does not run off into, these deten into the detention basin because it's all absorbed within the permeable uh, surface. Then we have some typical landscape stepping stones where there's then um, pervious areas between the stones. We've got planted rooftops, which typically uh, the applications are more of a flat roof installation, but you certainly can do it on low sloped roofs, and it doesn't have to necessarily be on the principal structure, it can be on a, an accessory structure. Now to continue our pervious surface definition, we added this little um, sort of condition, is that in order for it to be considered pervious, pavers and other permeable surfaces must be designed and constructed in accordance with DuPage County standard details as approved from time to time by the DuPage County Municipal Engineers Group. They will actually publish standard details that are acceptable for the entire county of DuPage, and they have done this consistently for many years. Um, and so these are all standard, standard details that the entire group of engineers have come to accept. Now, as we talk about lot coverage for single family residential, we also made Go ahead, uh, Alderman Messina. Just a quick question. I know you guys are talking about permeable pavers and stuff, but have we, have we given consideration to the price increase and that it brings on a resident that's looking to do a project? Go ahead. So these are just options that the homeowners will have if this amendment is approved. The um, direction that I heard from the council was to be able to provide some flexibility yeah. and then also account for stormwater concerns and so what we've done is sort of taken um, stormwater best management practices and tried to apply them here so that the homeowner has the option of picking from these different solutions now if they if they didn't want to use permeable surfaces they wouldn't have to that's not a requirement but it would now be um, not included in the lot coverage calculation how, how do we uh, enforce for instance if the a residence seals that, I mean, if they seal it, then it won't work. Well, it actually depends. There are certain sealants that can be used. So, for example, porous concrete, there actually is a sealant mm -hmm. that will actually <clears throat> sort of um, protect the concrete itself, but still keeps the, um, the pores of the concrete so it still functions. Now all of this will be evaluated and, and inspected when it comes through for permit because it does have to be reviewed by the engineer and then approved. Um, in terms of maintenance, there are some maintenance requirements as it gets installed and um, inspected, they're gonna have, the homeowner is gonna have to be educated about what those requirements are. I will say, however, that in terms of maintenance, the Morton Arboretum, has not had any maintenance problems and they have a much larger installation of permeable surface. So, and typically in terms of maintenance, it would be something where it could be um, swept off with a broom. It could be, uh, there's other, I think there's a sweeper 
uh, type maintenance that can be done. And then there's also, I think, some um, pressure washing. Um, it's not a high intense pressure washing, but it, it's certainly something where you can wash away. Now, the other thing to consider, though, is that typically the debris that falls into those um, pores are organic matter, and so they would decompose on their own anyhow. So they wouldn't affect the permeability is what the engineers have found, which is why these are widely acceptable. Okay. Go ahead. Alderman um, Woods. Yeah. Uh, when I talked to you earlier, you told me that the engineers had those details. I went to look for them. I could not find them. Could you tell me where those were at? Well, in terms of the, the DuPage County Municipal right, Engineers correct. Group, I believe that they're on the county's website. I went to their website. I'm not saying they're not there. I'm just telling you I could not find them. So under the uh, Municipal Engineers, I couldn't find it. Uh, found the min uh, minutes from a couple of meetings referencing them, but there was, uh, I found no details at all. And, okay. and that would be important since we're going to reference them as something that's okay to actually see what they are. Sure. Alderman Wesley. You're saying inspect these projects. Who inspects them? The village engineer, or excuse me, the city engineer. The city engineer is part of the municipal engineers group with DuPage County. So who's our city engineer that would inspect these? Go ahead. Baxter and Woodman. And who pays them? We do. No. Is there a fee? Would there be a fee to the resident on that? It would be part of the permit process. And what fee would that be? It, it depends on the scope of the work. Is it done by percentage or <coughs> square footage? or? Go ahead, Mr. Cage. Um, typically, when we use a consultant engineer, uh, they have a, um, a billable hour you know, rate. Uh, typically, when they're reviewing plans, and this happens typically more on a commercial basis, they'll review the plans, uh, provide a review, they'll document it, provide it to the city for review, and it's, you know, the hourly rate. So I would expect we would do the same thing, obviously. Um, what the city would be looking for if someone's looking to um, go above the 35% and use one of these facilities, it would be reviewed. Whatever we are charged by the consultant city engineer is what we would be looking as a reimbursable from the resident. Okay, um, Alderman uh, Woods. Follow up to that. So if we pass this the way it is and you're saying based on the standard uh, specifications and details by the Municipal Engineers Association. <coughs> Why do we need the engineer to review it then? If we're going to follow a standard detail, and I, I'm hoping that that's what we're trying to do, make life easier on everybody. Right. So yeah. as part of this, um, if it's just a, a permeable paver or a permeable surface installation, then it's likely that we could in-house just review their details based on the standard details. If we start getting into what we're going to be talking about next, where we're talking about a stormwater management system, then the, the engineer would likely review it for capacity or volume and looking at BMPs and that sort of thing. So there, there could be some additional engineer review time if it is standard details for an installation where it's not counted towards lot coverage and they're not looking to gain any volumetric capacity, then we could likely just review it in-house. Right. But so, I mean, for, I think that that was the question that was, uh, Alderman Wesley was getting to. That, so unless that you have uh, issues that trigger uh, looking at that engineering, that you're exceeding that square footage, just putting that driveway in and getting a permit wouldn't necessarily require any of that. The engineer would probably still go out and do the inspection because the engineer has more experience. And so it's likely that he would go out and, and do those inspections just because of we, we were not trained in um, those installations. Okay. Alderman uh, Sismoski. I have a two part question for you. One, is this just residential or is this also uh, industrial? So in terms of the definitions for the lot coverage, it would apply to any calculation of lot coverage. 
Okay. Second part, I'd I'd like to see this table to a future meeting for excessive materials that aren't being answered here. So, it's a motion. Can we what, just if, go ahead? A comment. I was going to say that maybe if we get because there is a lot of material here, mm -hmm. and 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 at least for me, there's a lot of things that aren't answered, but. I'd like to hear the presentation so we yeah, can get no, through right. it. Yes. No, I wouldn't mind. I just, and there's just way too much that's not being answered, and this thing is like it's huge. Right. You, you, pass one, a, you pass one thing, you pass something. Well, it's a, it's a lot of material, but, it, but I think since there's we're here and ready, we right. can see that. Listen to Go the ahead with the presentation. presentation. I'm sorry, uh, Odom and Jacob had a question. Uh, this uh, additional 10% over the 35 with the approved stormwater, in the beginning you showed us what other towns do. Is there similar to this? Or if they say 45 or 50, that's it? There's none of, nothing additional stormwater management system needed in those other towns? So um, actually what I was going to start discussing is that the, the proposed bonus, shall we say, is for 10%. If we were to go that route, it actually would still be inconsistent with other communities in terms of their uh, maximum that they allow. However, Elmhurst has a very similar program. In fact, we use that as sort of a model to, to come up with this uh, proposal before you tonight. Uh, and so many of the other communities don't have a maximum at all, whereas if they, Elmhurst has the maximum and then you can exceed it as long as you install an approved stormwater management system. Go ahead, follow up. And then going back to the earlier thing with the 60%, could you explain that a little bit better? Sure. So the, um, the lot coverage definition um, includes the calculation of impervious surfaces. So anything that is a permeable surface, you know, permeable pavers, porous concrete, those wouldn't count. But then the decks and the pool it pools would be counted as only 60% impervious. So you would get a little bit of a bonus for pools and decks because I understand that you know there was discussion that maybe they shouldn't count. And so we're trying to be a little bit consistent with our stormwater ordinance as well as provide a little bit of flexibility. So that's where the 60% comes in. Go ahead, Mr. Cage. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, just on a couple of the communities that I'm familiar with, uh, Park Ridge and Itasca, uh, their percentages do not include any stormwater management or best practices. So it's a <coughs> fixed percentage, yeah. whether it's, I know Park Ridge is 55 and I know uh, Itasca is 50, I believe. Now I understand that you know, we're comparing with the surrounding communities. Do we know what their flooding situation is in those surrounding communities? Go ahead. Uh, I can testify to the flooding situation in Park Ridge. It's very serious. Same here. Um, you know, I, I don't want to compare communities, but, um, you know, there's flooding issues. You know, I live in Itasca. There's flooding issues in Itasca. It seems like there's flooding issues in many communities. Um, and I think what we're, what we're looking at or what we're trying to analyze, and I know that was the direction, was to see what other communities do. But that doesn't mean we actually have to do exactly what other communities do. Now, I think the concern from the staff standpoint was, and we saw this last year with those, uh, I believe those three variances, the lot coverage variances, we have a number of properties that are, are at or slightly below that 35%. Um, and the, the issue is that people really don't have an option, and just like with those three cases, they don't have an option to if they buy the property to add to their deck, to add to their patio, to install a pool, those kind of things that as homeowners we typically want to do. Now, that, that's part of the issue right now. Those, that's why those people came in, applied for a variance, and went through the process. The reason we were looking at this was that 35%, we felt, you know, as a rule, was relatively low, but then we heard loud and clear from the council that there are flooding concerns. So I think what we were trying to do was allow some flexibility so we're not mandating each person who comes in has to get this kind of system or follows this process. They have options, but they also have the ability to increase over that 35%, but in a responsible way. Okay. This is my 
Sí. Well, you compare us to Itasca. Itasca's lots are much bigger than the lots in Wooddale. Lot size, lot, comparable lot sizes in Wooddale are a lot smaller than the lot sizes in Itasca. Go ahead. Um, I mean, that, that's an excellent point. The, what we tried to do was look at comparable communities in terms of location. Lot sizes in, you know, if you, if you pick R1 to R4, there's a big difference in lot size. We tried to be as close as we could, but bearing in mind that you go further away from um, the metropolitan area, the lots are going to get bigger. Um, Park Ridge, for example, the lots are smaller. So we, we try to take that into account as much as we can, but yeah, not every community is the same. Some of these lot sizes are different. So it's, you want to try and compare apples to apples, but in some cases it's not quite the same apple. Alderman Jacob. I guess one of my concerns here is we, we kind of talked about simplifying this for the homeowners and now we got a 60 per, you know, 60 percent of pools and decks we got to have an approved stormwater management system uh, to me it seems like this is going to be a lot of extra work for residents versus just having a flat you know percentage um, go ahead uh, with the information provided this evening it's it does seem complicated really where I see um, this going is it's probably going to be more work for staff because the, 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 the simpler option is, for example, if you don't want to go with any of the stormwater management and you, you want to expand on your deck, then we've got to work out the 60%. Typically, we will get a submittal. And we Sometimes people provide the calculations, but we always verify it. So in some instances when people are trying to make the calculations, we do assist them with that. So. The easier option is, for example, if you want to do a pool or a deck, is to calculate the 60%. I know um, Ms. Chrissy and myself would help anyone do that. Where it, you're, you're absolutely correct, where it does start getting a little bit more complicated is when you go with the 10% and the stormwater management, the best management practices. Mm -hmm. But really, the reason it's more complicated is because we're trying to address flooding in the community and allowing people to improve their property and I think it's it will be a much simpler process for example and a much more timely process than going through say a variance process. Alderman Messina. How much does one of the storm water management systems cost install? Um, if, if I could actually go through and show some of the options that residents might have I can't give you it really largely depends on what option they choose good is it more than the variance good. is there any cheaper option that is going to be as cheap as a variance well um, so a variance is typically there when there is a complication that is um, that the code doesn't allow and that there's a hardship. The, um, the reason that we are talking about the lot coverage now is because council has determined that there is an issue with the lot coverage as it stands now, or, or at least is, is interested in, in figuring out if there is perhaps a different way. So typically what happens is if you see a lot of variations for one particular item, then you look at the code because perhaps the code needs to be adjusted. So I'm not sure that we want to um, get into the habit of having people apply for variations if we can adjust the code accordingly. Good. But I don't want somebody just throwing a deck in their backyard just so I can count that as 60%. If I want to, I'll just throw a deck in the backyard or put a pool in and that'll count toward, that will count only as 60% towards that percentage. So you know what I mean? I'm worried about, so if I'm over my coverage, if you're telling me if I put a pool in the backyard or if I pull a deck in there, it's only 60%, right? Correct. So I, we could have homeowners randomly putting that in just to have add more space versus going through the process, have we, like to Peter's point, it just got very complicated and we thought it would just be a flat number and we move forward and we include structures or we don't include structures. I, I'd never heard anything about all this other stuff until today, until packet. Right? Go ahead. Um, 
So when, when we're talking about um, trying to provide some increased flexibility, what we were trying to do was to make a process that would address the concerns but also add the flexibility. To, to discount or to not include a deck um, because there's such variability in its construction didn't seem like it would be a good fit because then that could contribute to then additional stormwater runoff. So we we're trying to come up with a way to make some concessions on certain items that council had indicated that there was support for in terms of pools and decks, but also account for the fact that you can't always rely on that um, in terms of their uh, permeability. And so these are, these are options. Certainly, you know, they, they can be amended or, or modified prior to adoption, um, but these are, these are what staff came up with in terms of recommendations. Alderman Sarantino. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. As uh, mentioned earlier uh, from Alderman Sismarski and a uh, great point brought up by Alderman Wood is the fact that uh, in, in lieu of trying to shelf this or solve this tonight, we would allow staff to complete the presentation and then from there possibly formulate any concerns or questions and bring that forward at a later date. We seem to be going around in circles here without even uh, letting the presentation be completed. It's possible that some of the concerns or questions tonight could very well be answered. If not, we've agreed that we would then put this off perhaps down the road. But this is, uh, what's up there? I can't ask you, sorry. Yeah. Alderman Woods. Yeah, I was going to. I'll, I'll tag on to that. Uh, I would say let's, let's go through this because there is a lot of material and there's a lot of questions. And, and some of them will, will be answered or at least give us more uh, information to talk about. And then uh, after that, we can table this to the next committee meeting on the 25th. And in the interim, those questions we can fax or email to uh, staff to, to get those answered or at least they'll, they can compile our questions and, and put together some good answers or presentation to, to answer those questions. Mr. Mervis. I'd like to follow up on uh, Alderman Woods. If you could email me the questions or, or staff the questions, that would be great. Also, I don't know, um, 25th may not be the best idea because we have the budget that night. So maybe the meeting after that, and that will give us more time for you guys to send the questions in and, and get this and going. Spring comes and then there's multiple well, Hold on, Mr. Smosky. Just to amend my uh, motion to table for the reason, one pretty important reason, right? We are in the process of annexing numerous areas in my board. I don't want this to have to sway any of the people's decisions to annex into Wooddale if they're told they can only do so much lot cover. We'll see what they have, see what their lots have right now. Because they have a lot of bigger lots. And I don't know what their coverage is. A lot of them like to stay in unincorporated areas because they don't have our government telling them what to do. They have county. So if this might sway their decision to move in, I'd like to see what we can do to help them to come back in there. Go ahead. Um, if, they, if these areas are to annex, then they have, at current time, they have a 35% maximum, regardless of their lot size. All of the single-family lots have the same maximum lot coverage. The, the proposal is actually to provide some flexibility where you don't count permeable surfaces, but then it also gives the option if you wanted to go past the 35% and make additional improvements, then we've got um, a, a proposed stormwater management system. And if there's no other questions. Yeah, we can continue all the way to the end and we can hold our questions to the end. Go ahead. So the, the proposal is to allow an additional 10% over and above the 35%, but only if they have an approved stormwater management system. And so what this is, is a net zero impact. So the additional stormwater runoff generated by that additional um, lot coverage, because this is all impervious surface, um, then will all be captured by the stormwater management system. The proposed definition for a stormwater management system, and again, these definitions have all been um, approved or at least uh, agreed to by the city engineer, 
is that it's a storage of stormwater in a manner that promotes infiltration into the ground while also providing volumetric storage for additional runoff. And so then we've provided a definition for runoff, water that flows over the surface of the land when rainfall is not able to infiltrate the soil due to soil saturation, impervious surface, or the rate of rainfall exceeds the rate of water infiltration into the ground. And so I'd like to go through a few examples of stormwater management systems that residents then would be able to install as part of this proposal. So we have some French drains, which are just simply drains underground. We've got a rain garden, um, which you know could be any, any number of different plants. They can have it in any, any location um, that will help to sort of direct the stormwater into it and then it has some capacity or volumetric um, capacity there. There's also some underground storage options. These are obviously scaled too large, but essentially the idea is the same that a resident could have some sort of underground uh, storage for their uh, stormwater management system. There's also an option of a dry well, which is something that I have uh, pretty consistently seen, which is essentially a hole in the ground that has certain types of rock. You put a perforated pipe in there and you run your stormwater into the dry well. It then percolates into the ground from there. Rainwater harvesting system, most people typically think of rain barrels as being their rainwater harvesting system. However, there are also other options for that where you could have an underground rainwater storage tank or a cistern. This could be something as simple as you use this rainwater to then water your garden or water your grass. You could use it to wash your cars. In some instances, you could even connect it into the house and use it for washing clothes. You could use it for, you could treat it if you wanted to as part of the system. And again, these are all options. The, the resident is going to be the one that would, would determine within their price range what would be most appropriate for them. And so the proposal, uh, the sp specific proposal is that for the lot coverage maximum, an additional 10% will be uh, allowed when an approved stormwater management system is installed to capture additional runoff generated by air the area over the maximum. Um, I do have some additional presentation for the remainder of the um, amendments, so I'll just go through those quickly. One of the other option, or one of the other challenges that I noticed was that for public hearings, depending on the type of request, there were different public hearing notification requirements. In order to be consistent and to ensure that every single time we have the same notification requirements, we are, have proposed to consolidate into one location what those public hearing requirements are. These are consistent with state statute. The attorney has reviewed these and concurs with all of these, uh, with, with all of this. Essentially, it's just moving the same requirements. The only real change that we're making here is that the current requirement for mailed notif notices to adjacent property owners is 250 feet, excluding the rights of way. As we have to do a manual calculation, we're, we're proposing just to ease the, um, the, automate the process really is, is to have a simple 300 feet. In terms of the definitions, I know Mr. Cage talked a little bit about some of those definitions, but essentially the goal here is to clarify the meanings of terms used in the UDO and to ensure the consistent application and interpretation. There were some inconsistencies in terms of definitions that where there was perhaps a, a term that was defined in the text of the document and then it was defined maybe a little bit differently in the definition. And so we, we uh, reconciled those discrepancies. There were also some terms that were not defined. Uh, I know that Mr. Cage mentioned comprehensive plan. There was also one for, um, I believe it was hard dust-free surface or something of that nature. So there were, there were a few that needed some additional clarification because there's been some confusion about what those terms meant. There were some, uh, was some discussion about parking uh, as part of the UDO amendments. As staff, we realize that some additional research is needed to determine whether or not the parking ratios are adequate or appropriate for the various uses. And we also recognize that the city has expressed a desire to be business friendly. 
and we know that there are a number of non-conforming properties where perhaps the business owners may have a difficult time trying to get a new tenant in if they don't have sufficient parking. What, what is being proposed is to allow the required number of parking spaces to be an allowable variation. Um, and, and the reason for this is that, one, it provides some flexibility, but there still is the variation process if they feel the need, you know, if, if they feel that they're justified in, in requesting this variation. So they still have to meet the standards for granting a variation in order to be awarded this, and ultimately council would decide that. Um, the other aspect of the parking variations is that the, because we have so many businesses that have a non-conforming parking situation, there is, there is going to be some difficulty um, in, in having, let, shall I say, there, the businesses that want to get a new use in there where there's not sufficient parking will then come before um, the CDC and then ultimately council to potentially request additional variations. So if there was an option to requ require uh, or to vary the number of required parking spaces, then perhaps they won't come before council requesting variations for the parking stall width, the depth, the drive aisle. So there's, there's some trade-offs here, I, I suppose. You could look at it from the perspective of, well, we don't want to grant this, but at the same time, if you don't allow parking stalls, the number of parking stalls to be varied, then you may be potentially seeing some other types of parking stall variations in effect so that they can then achieve their goals. <coughs> in terms of the parking ratio, we have a number of motor vehicle repair uh, shops in the city and the ratio currently is one to 200 square feet. This is unusual in terms of what I've seen in other communities because an auto repair place is typically parked based on the number of bays, the work bays that they have, because that's sort of indicative of how many parking spaces. Um, but the other thing that we notice is that there is a distinction, or there are multiple types of sort of vehicle repair places and, and gas stations. So we have gas stations, we have service stations, which are gas stations that have some motor vehicle repair component with it. We have mini marts, which are gas stations that have just the convenience store component with it. And then we have motor vehicle repair. And, um, and so there's some differences in, in their parking needs. And so we think that we need to take a closer look at those parking ratios. But at this time, we're proposing two parking spaces per work bay, plus one space for 500 square feet of office and lobby space for the motor vehicle repair facilities. And then finally, in terms of the, the, some of the number of uh, amendments that are being proposed, a lot of them are to reduce inconsistencies and to make the UDO a little bit more user friendly. I know that we had, the council, uh, I believe it was a couple years ago, approved an amendment to increase the garage heights to 17 feet. Well, we had another area of the code that conflicted in that because it wasn't updated when the council approved that amendment. So we went through and, and then just fixed that so that it was consistent. Um, there were also some text and graphics that weren't consistent with one another, so we cleaned that up. And then we, we recognized the need that there may be some additional amendments. This is really just, um, because we were looking at lot coverage and we knew that we had some other challenges, we were trying to um, make the best use out of uh, the amendment process. I do have um, each of the documents that are redlined if anybody wants to go through and has specific questions about the proposed amendments. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Alderman uh, Wesley. You know, we have to do something with this lot coverage for residents. Uh, in Ward 1, we got one subdivision over there, Ethan Woods, I think. Almost every lot coverage, every lot in there is going to come in for a variance of some source. So, I mean, are we going to be resident friendly too on this too? Um, we're the lowest, we're, we're at 35%. And these other towns, you know, that would make a judgment call of me going to another town to buy a house if I'm looking at towns that I could put on a deck or I could put a, a swimming pool in or whatever it is. 
So I think we have to look at that too because the residents are going to go to the next neighborhood. Well, the member seen it? We all agreed that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we just we didn't want to get crazy and get to the max, but we knew we needed a bump because after we saw those few last year, it was just like on the cusp, right? And they're, they're forking over $400 to do a variance, and, and these are real costs, right? And then we come here and, you know, it's which is still an have price, but I know the price of treatment, you know, of one of these storage things is going to cost thousands of dollars, and, and we've Alderman Jacobs point, we've just complicated the process, which is part of the feedback we got from residents before, was that it's just so complicated, keep it simple. So in my opinion, I'm just hoping if you guys go back, we just, we move the number a little bit, that's reasonable, because we're just way off, that we, it sounds like it's a compromise amongst the council to just say what's enough, without all the complications and the costs that you guys are proposing. Alderman Jacob. Yeah, uh, kind of going back to what a couple of us have set, set up here. I, I mean, this just seems like a whole lot more work for the right. I mean, we wanted to simplify this. So now one of our residents in our ward that had work on a patio, now he's got to come up with a stormwater management system to add an extra two feet onto his patio. I mean, it seems like way too complicated. And then you had mentioned it's going to be more work on staff's time, so now the resident's going to have to come in, and you're going to ask them for a drawing, and now you're going to, you guys are going to have to spend time trying to do these calculations. To me, it just seems like we're really overcomplicating things here. I, I think, at least I know from what I hear from some of the other aldermen, we wanted to simplify this for residents. Yeah, we want to simplify it, but always taking consideration the flooding situation in our town. Um, each area is different. I get it. But we just had a presentation November 12 on the flood in um, 215 acres in the third ward drains to one pipe. So if we start changing percentages around, that's, I believe that's going to add to the problem. So yeah, I want to move it, but I don't know about 45 percent. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, uh, Alderman Woods. Yeah, I just wanted to say, again, this is a complicated issue, and I don't I, I, I think in part the staff followed our direction. I know because there's a lot of material and a lot of things being said, it seems more complicated than it is. And, and I agree that we should clean it up a little bit to make it less complicated because there's, right now, we don't even know what that number is. So, if, I mean, 60 is a sliding scale for coverage. It's 30, uh, 35 percent plus 60 percent of some things. and. And so from that perspective, I, I get it. It should be easier to calculate for us as a community uh, to figure out how we're going to be affected also. So uh, I think this way, if we digest what we heard and, and can mentally apply it to things that have come before us before and see how that works through once, once we've uh, uh, digested, uh, I think with some minor tweaking, uh, I think we got the makings of a, a good system. Mr. Anyway. Murmurs? Yeah, again, going back on what Alderman Wood said, you know, we're just kind of digesting it tonight. You all are digesting it tonight. It's overly complex tonight, obviously. Alderman Catalano is correct. We wanted to be extra sensitive towards the stormwater concerns because there's always stormwater concerns in Wooddale. So if we took it a little bit too far, what we'll do next time is we'll simplify the presentation, maybe, maybe make it a little bit more easier to understand, simplify the options, get what, you know, Alderman Messina wanted, you know, what he was talking about with making it easier for the resident, not maybe making it this grandiose of a thing. In the interim, maybe if you can send us your questions based upon all the material tonight, and then that'll help in addition to us revising when we bring it back. And again, not necessarily the 25th, but in short order, it may be unrealistic to do it on the 25th just because the budget lasts a long time anyway. Alderman Messina. Yeah, no, I, really just, I think we all just need to come up with a common goal. I think we all have conflicting goals, but I think this kind of, we're both saying the same thing, just what's responsible growth? I don't want a young family not buying a house here like that poor couple that was here. That I personally know that are telling every one of their friends don't buy a house in Wooddale because of the complications. Enough where they can grow, 
but where it's responsible where we don't have flooding. And, and you're right, 45 is insane. How do we just tweak it a little bit and keep it simple and please don't burden the residents with additional costs? That's it. Well, Jacob. There was a, a part in here, and I, for some reason I can't find it right now, where it talked about taking away the uh, fence around pools. Um, I don't know if either of you know where, where exactly where that was and what, why that was. Go ahead. That's actually a duplication. It's a requirement in the building code. And so in order to keep it in one location, we're just removing it from the UDO because it's technically a building code requirement. Okay, so it is still a requirement. Yeah. Absolutely, okay. Okay. yes. That's why I want clarification. Thank you. Well, the Mrs. Muskie. The building code requirement requires you have a six foot fence surrounding your property or a fence on the pool with a locking staircase. It, it requires a four foot tall fence around the pool, depending on if it's, um, if it's an above ground pool, then you can actually have a locking staircase as part of that. Otherwise you have to, I, I believe, and, and I don't know exactly. Oh, I have one because I like the airwood. But it's not a six foot tall requirement around the entire property. You can, that would work, that would meet the building code requirement. Right. Okay. okay, so uh, we're gonna table this and um, to a later date. I think March, the March 10th, March 10th, probably. March 10th, and uh, motion on the floor already. well, I'm gonna make the motion. I already made a motion. Oh, I'll okay. second that motion. And uh, if we can email all the questions to uh, Mr. Mermis. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Items to consider for future meetings. Uh, annexation for areas A through M uh, to be determined, date to be determined. And uh, next is additional wayfinding signs. That's uh, also to be determined. Uh, any other uh, items? Need a motion to adjourn? Make the motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. I'd like to call the order of the Public Health, Safety, and Judiciary Committee. Uh, let it be known that the same uh, folks are on the dais that was here before. Uh, <laughs> I would like a motion for an approval of the minutes of the meeting of January 28th. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. At this time, I'd like uh, Chief Vesta to come up, please, and uh, give us a uh, report on the recommended changes to the uh, false alarm ordinance. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before you tonight is the outlines of, uh, we're looking for some amendments to our false alarm ordinance. Our current one is kind of outdated for a couple reasons. Uh, one is because we used to monitor a lot more alarms centrally at the police department. Uh, through a central station, through like an ADT type thing that supplied our alarm board. Those have been decreasing over the last 10 years to the point that most of them were eventually transferred to central station al alarms where you have call centers that are answering. Um, also, the fact that our dispatch center has since closed, we don't monitor any in-house anymore. So the old ordinance was more written for uh, alarms that were connected to our alarm board and dealing with false alarms. And at the same time, uh, while we were able to enforce some of these false alarms that we received here and, and provide uh, some return of expenses that we were having on going out for false alarms, uh, the current fee structure uh, starting at $25 doesn't even begin to cover some of the costs that we're incurring for false alarms. So uh, each year we have about an average, it goes from 800 to 1,000 every year, false alarms that we respond to for, so two or three a day on average. Um, and with all alarms, we are always, two officers are dispatched out. Uh, you know, depending on the size of the building, um, you know, you, you might spend anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes on an alarm call. And if it's something that the key holder has requested that we remain there until they, they get there to help check out the building with us, sometimes it can be longer. So what we're looking to do is really, uh, some places, you know, we might get one false alarm a year and it, it's not an ongoing problem. And we certainly don't wanna penalize someone for having a false alarm. It, it happens at every house. Uh, someone forgets the code, uh, happen, you know, happens at houses and businesses. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking to do is uh, put in a, rewrite the ordinance to deal with alarms that are received from outside companies and also uh, to kind of adjust the fees for 
uh, really alarms that become problematic. Um, so we would be looking to uh, allow everyone up to three false alarms per year without any possible consequences. Um, we would track those in-house uh, through uh, some staff reassignments that we had with the closing of dispatch center. Uh, once we get to the fourth and fifth false alarm per year, uh, we're looking at uh, requesting that uh, there's no, a fee of $50 for response if those are uh, legitimate false alarms. Uh, sixth and seventh alarms going up to $100. The eighth through tenth alarms up to $200 and eleventh and over up to $350 each. Uh, a lot of towns actually have some fees that are even more uh, higher than this, and, and we're not looking to make a bunch of money or charge extravagant fees, but hopefully after the third alarm, and we've sent out the required notice to the, to the business, which seems to be more the problem, or residents, they're going to work with their alarm company to make sure they don't have more problems. Um, if we continue to have problems, uh, you know, the, the fee structure would go up for, you know, tying up our, our resources and taxpayer resources for responding to false alarms that aren't being, uh, they're not addressing the issue that they're having in the business. Um, you know, certainly uh, we're not looking, like, like I said, we're not looking to penalize people, uh, you know, out outrageously, but we do have to address the issue of having excessive false alarms uh, in our cost for it. Alderman Messina? <coughs> I struggle with this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had it, right? And as you see more of these systems going to wireless, you're having residents have the burden of putting up sensors. I know I put all my own sensors, all my own window sensors, all my glass break sensors myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so the opportunity for error with residents is, is going to be pretty high. I'm not saying we only you know, burden the, the businesses, but I'll tell you what, I mean, I, if I got a ticket at a certain point, I would say blame the airport, blame the plane, because there's no doubt it went off one time because the plane almost probably took down my chandelier, as we all know, right? right? right. So you're going to start getting stuff from the airport noise, the plane noise, especially as we get closer. How, how do we deal with that? I don't know. So I have a problem with the residential side of it, especially as most of these systems, residential-wise, go self-service. I can't support it. Well, you know, we could certainly look at, a, you know, I think if if a residence is getting maybe not at three, but you know, you're getting six, eight, ten a year from a residence, there's got to be some issues that that I feel they have to address at some point because otherwise. You know, if you're getting 10 a year from a residence, they're just not fixing their problem. So I, even if there was, you know, this is why it's open for discussion, even if there was for residences you wanted to say, hey, let's give them five false alarms a year. We can track and separate those out. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at a starting point here. And, um, you know, businesses, those are more likely professionally installed. And I, I would be in support of that if you wanted to kind of separate the two out. Oliver and Jacob. Uh, living in a condo and being on the board of directors, I know the fire department does something similar to this. Um, do you know, I, I, I don't know offhand, it, first of all, would this count? Because usually when the fire department comes out, the police come out too. So would that count as one alarm for the fire and for you guys, or is that just for the fire department? This would be just for uh, burglar alarms that we receive. Just burglar, okay. Yeah. And. Do you, I, I don't know, again, I know the fire department is its own entity, but is this anywhere? I know they have something in place like this. Do you know if this is similar to what they have? I know our condo building has gotten a letter saying after X amount of alarms, you're going to have to pay for each call. Or I'm not exactly sure what their structure is, um, but if we do go out and respond with the fire department, we consider that an assist to the fire department as opposed to a burglar alarm activation. So this would really be separate from that. Uh, final question is, is this fee structure that you're proposing, is this similar to other municipalities around us? Really, there's a mix. Um, some are much higher, much quicker, and that's not our goal with this. Uh, but as of right now, uh, being down at $25, people, it, it, that really is no incentive for someone to correct the problem. Some people, you know, $25 nowadays, I mean, I'm not saying it's nothing, yeah. but when this was written, 
you know, over a decade ago, it really wasn't wasn't any incentive now to get someone to change if they're having multiple fossil, fossil alarms. So. Alderman Woods. Yeah, I wanted to ask because Randy's got uh, experience. So, are the planes setting the uh, alarm off, or are we? It's we don't that, know. I, I, I don't, it's either that or it goes to my house. So I had Chandler <laughs> fall. Uh, I know at least our house closer to E. You know, they start to shake, right? And Peter feels that in his building. Um, I know I've had sensors, glass break sensors, even go off because of that vibration at a certain point. So inevitably, yeah. No, I, I mean, that's good yeah. info. I mean, I wouldn't have yeah. uh, really thought about it. And, it and then the next, because it sounds like you did yours, do they have different settings for the, I mean, do they have, so like on a car alarm, uh, you, you can change the sensitivity. Do they have different levels of ones that you can? You can I'm, I'm not sure. So I guess the question is, it is it solvable? And if not, then, I mean, because that plays into what we're talking about. From at least my company, no. Sensors on the door, and, and that's it. And the glass break sensor senses it. I don't know if you can adjust that. At least I couldn't see it. Uh, I'm not saying it couldn't be done if I called the company, though. Right. You know, but everything mostly is going to self service. Like you install your own, you do your own, and that's it. Um, that's why I thought for the ones that are professional. Why don't you just go out for dinner and talk about it? <laughs> Alden and Wesley, you're buying dinner, you said? <laughs> <laughs> if that's what we're going to talk about, that's fine. Well, I guess the chief. I was just going to say a possible solution. Um, maybe if we could enact this right now for businesses that are professionally installed and do a one year study at the same time of residences and see how many are the most we have at residences. And if no one's getting over three, then we that's really not the problem then. It, you know, I'd be fine with that too. Let's see the rest of the questions up here before we go anywhere. Go ahead, Alderman Wesley. I would like to see a different charger for residents, a lower charge. And when you do this for businesses, is it also on their business license of the fees that are on here when they apply for their business license? Is the question, will we add this to the business license process to say? Is it, is it on there now? No, it's not that I'm aware Why? of. Why? I don't know. It should be. Yeah. Well, that's something could that we, we could add with the next business license procedure, work with the clerks to put this on the form. This way they know up front. Alderman Sismarski. I'd like to see you shorten that time span of a year to a, six months. 17 years, of, 17, 18, 18 years of living in my house, being under the runway. I have the same thing. He has sensitive windows. Never once went off, so that fire is chandelier inspector or whoever installed it but uh i'd rather see that not a year since we already have new runways coming in and we already have all the complaints going on with the noise you shouldn't have no problem with people coming in and saying they've got problems you don't have to wait a year chief i mean six we're, we're going to be doing the data anyways so if you want to come back we can just do a six month review and then decide if we want to go further with it i, I don't think the data is going to change much from six months to a year so that, that's fine it, it won't affect how we collect the data problem, if there's that many problems you're going to know right away anyways right final question alderman jacob uh question chief i mean ward four has had the planes for many many years uh, and the, have you found in the past ward four has had more residential alarms go off than other wards? It's, it's all over. It's businesses all over. It's not necessarily just that that we're seeing. Uh, we do have some businesses that uh, we know there's problems with their system and they just choose not to do anything because it does, there's no really uh, incentive for them to, to make changes. One more question, Alderman Wesley. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that put this in effect for businesses as is and do the six month review on the I'll second that president. roll call all in favor aye. 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 aye aye so be it get a new chandelier <coughs> done all right, uh, items to be considered at future meetings. Uh, and then at this time, I'd like a motion for an adjournment. Wait. I'll make the motion. Wait. Wait, hold on. What's this?
Item, Alderman Sismarski. Item for future. Uh, oh, okay. I'd like to give the chief uh, authorization to go out and look for uh, educational things for truck enforcement and DOT certifications for our, a couple of our officers, seeing as we have a lot of trucks parked in our area. I want to be checking for insurance since there's a lot of fires going on in, in our trucks and all the trucks that do come through our area. At least we would get the money and not the state of Illinois who parks on Wooddale Road and Irving Park Road in 83 pulling trucks over, that money would come to our city instead. Chief, please. I was just going to mention that we do have a certified truck enforcement officer that works day shift, and he, he does write quite a few citations a year for overweight citations. What I could do is look into the other ed education requirements for, yes, yeah, so, some, some further certifications to see how much that is. So. Thank you, Chief. Okay. I believe uh, we're adjourned. We, we motioned it, didn't we? Second. Motion for adjournment. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. I'd like to call the uh, Public Works Committee to order. Let the minute taker uh, show that the same members, except for Roy Wesley, who's left the building, are present. Uh, First, I uh, make a motion to approve the minutes from the January 28, uh, 2016 meeting. I'll make second. that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? That carries. Um, uh, next is approval of final payment request to Schroeder Asphalt Services, Inc. for the Woodside Subdivision Street Resurfacing Project in an amount not to exceed $23,842.23. That is my motion. Second. Roll call. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yep. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. That passes. Next, uh, approval of contract for design and construction management of Murray Drive with Baxter and Woodman in an amount not to exceed $26,850. That is my motion. Second. Questions? Roll call. <clears throat> Alderman Sismarski? No. Alderman Woods? Yes. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. Alderman Sorrentino? Yes. Alderman Messina? Yes. Alderman Catalano? Yes. Alderman Jacob? Yes. That passes. Next items to be considered at future meetings. Tree planting contract in March 10th. Construction contract forest view in March. INI contract in March. Streetlight policy in March. Lincoln Court streetlights in March. Edgewood sidewalk in March. Mill Road water main in March and South Treatment Plant Feasibility Study to be determined. Uh, March is already booked. <laughs> I think we're pretty busy in March. That's a little uh, Is there anything, uh, Alderman Roy Wesley? Um, talk about the water treatment plant. We talked about getting that inspected, calling the inspector in for safety reasons. Mr. Murmurs, have we? How are you doing on that? Yes, indeed, we did. Um, there was a couple updates and some reports in the packet, and it mentioned that, and it mentioned that they were coming out. I think when were they coming? Be done by the end of February. End of February, they'll do their audit. It's going to be a packet form. I'm not going to get a half a page, right? We'll Should make be it. A packet. We'll make I'll it. Make at least a page. Make it good. Okay. Any other requests or questions? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned.